Uh, Michelle invited me here today to uh, talk to you all a little bit about what we do at Mass Wildlife and in particular the Central District Office, which is the district office for all of Worcester County. Um, my name is Becca. I am the fisheries uh, and aquatic biologist for Central District. I just finished my PhD in um, Connecticut this past May, and so I'm pretty new to the team, so they sent me to, you know. But I do know by now a lot of what goes on in our district office, and so I have a lot to share with you today and some pictures. Um, I tried to keep today's presentation to about a half hour, so we have the other half hour just to chat or answer questions or talk about how you like to recreate in the outdoors or questions you have about fish or wildlife. Where is your district office? Our district office is in West Boylston, to oh, the yeah. London oh, Temple Street. Oh, yeah. Yep, right, right on the southern edge of Wachusett Reservoir. Yeah. Um, okay. is, yeah, there's some walking trails. Oh, that used to be a radar. Oh, there it did, oh, and we actually four. have... I grew, up, I grew up out there. Yes, it, it, we actually still have the original U.S. Army wood stove in the front. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Yeah, so it did used to be a, a radar station, that's correct. <laughs> um, yeah, and so... Uh, as I talk today, please feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. As you probably all know by now, I brought some material. Please help yourself, um, and I'll leave behind what's what's left for, for the facility here. All right, so as I said, um, we're the Central District Office. There are five district offices for Mass Wildlife, and our headquarters is located in West Boylston, which is actually also in this, or sorry, in uh, Westboro, which is also in this district. So there are five district offices from left to right, those are the Western District, the Connecticut Valley District, the Central District, and then we have Northeast and Southeast. And so you can see the lines dipping them up, and we're right here in the middle. Um, these, the, it's also annotated with where our hatcheries are, and other points of interest of stars. And our uh, our district office addresses is there, and it's also on my business card. You know where the first warm water fisheries West, um, fish I, I am not sure which one was the first. The one in Sutton. The one in Sutton, is yeah. that right? Yes. Yeah. Wow, okay. Yeah, on the uh, West Sutton Road, and there's a, a monument in there to Merrill, who was the one who... Oh, who, on Mer for Merrill Pond. Yes. Yeah, yes, right. they're actually right now doing, I do know that's an old hatchery because they're doing a uh, bridge and dam restoration there. They're going to put in a fishing spot and restore that dam into like a bridge mm -hmm. and, and do some, uh, some nice, I think they're going to put in the Well, they had to put bridge in because it's a cemetery across the pond, right. which they didn't know. But anyway. yeah. <laughs> right, and yeah, I, and that used to have all the pond systems in there, and so they filled a couple of them, but they're going to keep, I think, the remainder ones as historical They didn't, they didn't fill them, no. None of the back ones? No, I think you, they filled some back It gets a lot of fill them, but I was on conservation, so. Yeah, okay, great. So a little bit about what we do uh, at Mass Wildlife and in particular at the Central District Office. So we do fisheries management and research, that's my domain. We also do wildlife management and research. Uh, we have wildlife management areas or WMAs and we do a lot of land stewardship activities to take care of the lands that we have for different reasons, different purposes. And we do a lot of outreach and development also. Um, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So our crew, we have a district manager who sent me here today. <laughs> <laughs> and we have our district clerk who tends to answer the phone, so if you call, that's usually who you get. And then we have three different biologists, the land stewardship biologist who does a lot of our habitat and land acquisition work um, and protecting our lands. We have our wildlife biologist and then I'm our fisheries biologist. And we also have five technicians that help us carry out any of the work that we have to do because it's, it's a lot that goes on all at once, <laughs> all the time. And so our daily office activities include things like license sales, so people can come on site and buy licenses for fishing, for hunting, or they can make donations to Mass Wildlife or purchase other types of information, including different pamphlets. We'll do, we have a game check station, so people who hunt and want to check in or need to check in and don't want to do it online or can't do it online, they can check in their harvested animal on site. We're also a fish weighing station. Mass Wildlife has a 
pinfish program where if you catch a fish of a certain size, you get entered into a, um, an award potential group. And uh, if you have the biggest fish, you get awarded a pin. And everyone who has a fish above a certain size will get like the base level pin, then you have the gold pin, and every year you have the biggest one, and a special pin if you've caught the most species, things like that. And so we're an official weighing station. There's two types of those pin fish. There's the catch and release that does not need to be weighed, but a catch and keep fish does need to be weighed because you're, you're keeping that fish anyway, and so we'd like a weight on it. We also offer a lot of local advice. This is most of our time at the office, is answering calls about wildlife, um, encounters or wildlife sightings, places to hunt or just general hunting questions, and places to fish and general fishing questions as well. Um, and we also get a lot of walk-in questions from people too. So we get those in calls and we get them in person. And we welcome those. Any questions, give us a call. Or if you want to chat about a rabbit you saw outside, give us a call. <laughs> Um, okay. So then we have our sort of our, our content specific activities. These happen seasonally year round. Um, and for our fisheries activities, these include things like trout stocking. So trout stocking occurs in the spring and in the fall, two different times of the year. Uh, and this past fall, we actually stocked about 85,000 fish. And the spring stocking is much larger than the fall stocking. Are those specific areas that you do that? Yes, they are. And they're all the same ones? Yeah, okay. typically the same ones. There are some adjustments every year. So this past fall, because of the drought, we um, many of the districts had to make adjustments to where they were stocking. So in Central District, we removed pretty much all of our rivers and streams because there was not enough flow. Mm -hmm. um, but all of our lakes and ponds stayed on because they were suitable habitat still for those fish to go into. And they were fishable. So those are sort of the two considerations when we're stocking is, are the fish going to make it and be okay where we're putting them? And then can people get in to fish those, those trout that we're putting in? Because that's ultimately what we want people to be able to you fish for them. You put in waterways where the people live around these bodies of water? Yes. You do? We do, yeah. So we have, we have um, sort of uh, criteria that we have to meet. And it's at, the, it's at the discretion of the biologist. So I make those decisions. The Western District biologist makes those decisions for their district and so on and so forth. And um, one of the biggest ones is access. So we want to make sure that where we're putting fish is publicly accessible. And if it is not, then we will remove that site from our list because these fish are a public resource and they should, wherever we're putting them, should have public access mm -hmm. people can get in. Um, there have been cases where land development changes, and so we have to adjust those over time to make sure that, you know, maybe a lake that was suitable five years ago is no longer suitable because it was residentially developed. Mm -hmm. Things like that happen. Okay. So both Nanchag and Kimilteri? Uh, yeah. Yep. How about Ramshorn? Nope. Ramshorn is not on. I think that one... No public access. Yeah, I'm not sure about the public access of that one. Hey. And then, and we, yeah, I don't. Well, right. So, so there are some places that have really minor public access, and um, we have to weigh those against the other bodies of water that we have that might have better access because because we have li a limited number of fish. I mean, there's a lot of fish yeah. <laughs> that we put out. I think Mass Wildlife, I believe, on the main government website, um, it states that. In a year, we stock more than 500,000 fish wow. uh, across the state. So it's a really large program, but when you break it down into district and then into each town or like you know region that you want to serve, you know you have fewer and fewer fish to put in places. So we have to make those those choices uh, in a really informed way. And then the other thing we have to consider when we're stocking fish is: are there wild fish that are spawning in that area that we want to protect? So our wild brook trout populations are really big right now um, in terms of that. And in sort of the really old school, like when fisheries management started to become a field, the, the old school thinking was, you know, we should stock on top of wild populations to supplement those populations. We know now that it's actually the opposite. When you have a wild spawning population, you should actually protect that population and not stock on top of it because then they'll be competing for resources. So we've, we're making adjustments over time to not stock on top of wild brook trout populations that we already have. And because fishing for wild fish is really exciting. Do you count fish? 
Do what? Do you count fish? We do count fish. We do. Yes, we do. So whenever we're doing this, um, we're, we, we're estimating count by I mean, week. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we for this we estimate, we estimate by weight. So we'll take a, a, a yeah. so the hatchery has different ponds or different yes. sections of it, yeah. and you'll take a, a, a net out and you'll count that net yeah. and get a weight on it, okay. and then you can sort of calculate out and estimate how many fish for those next nets. So you're weighing every net and you have sort of like a scaling factor that you calculated and you can estimate how many fish you're you're putting in but we know exactly the weight that we're putting out huh. yeah and so this is what our stocking truck looks like um, you can see there's a little bit of space on the platform so we can stand on it when we're working with the tank uh, the tanks have aerators so that we're constantly pushing in air to the water so the fish actually need oxygen just like we do in the water and if you put them all in a bowl they'll eventually breathe through all their oxygen they need more. So we aerate the water to make sure they can keep breathing. And then when we're ready to release them, we can either open these top hatches and scoop them out, or we can open these bottom hatches and send them out right into the water. And so that's the easiest way for us to do is yeah. we'll pull up to a body of water if we can get right alongside it or on a beach or on, mm -hmm. on a boat ramp, um, and we'll open those and we'll just let them flush out. It's, it's really quick. It's a little bit less stressful for them than mm -hmm. being in a net, but whenever we're using nets, we're also really quick about it, you know, just in the water, in the water. That's how big or how old are the fish that you put up? It varies a lot. In the fall, so our just our last stocking season, they're monsters. <laughs> <laughs> they're, yeah. Um, yeah, they're, you know, 14 wow. inches or 12 inches maybe. Um, in the spring, we'll stock smaller fish, so maybe like six inches plus, nine inches plus. We tend to have those bins like that, like nine plus, 12 plus, et cetera. Um, and it really depends where they're going. So in the fall, we focus on really on larger, deeper bodies of water because we know that we're coming into winter. We wanna make sure those fish have the ability to drop down, to find thermal refuge if they need to. But in the springtime, we have a little bit more wiggle room because the temperatures are gonna be a little bit friendlier to these fish. We're not you know, immediately going into an overwintering situation. And so we'll put those smaller fish into smaller streams mm -hmm. um, and we'll keep those bigger fish typically into the bigger rivers and bigger lakes and reservoirs and things cool. like that. Yeah, so it varies a lot. And we have multiple species that we put up as well. We have rainbow trout, we put out brown trout, um, and occasionally with other stocking programs, we'll do tiger trout. And then we also have some amount of pike stocking that occurs, northern pike. Do eagles and ospreys tend to prey on the uh non-native fish? I, I can't say for sure whether they're more of a target or not. Um, certainly, I mean, a rainbow trout, when you, when you let it out, you can see, like, they'll sometimes they'll hang out in the shallows first while they're adjusting to the new water and figuring out where they want to go. Uh, and you can see them pretty clearly through. But I don't, I don't actually know if you know, if, they're, if the eagles or, or birds of prey are being selective at all, that'd be a really neat question actually to look at. I don't know how you would look at it. <laughs> but it would, it's neat to consider for sure. And certainly there are other places in the world where that, that's true, where birds of prey and other predators will target non-natives because they stand out really well. They follow the truck? <laughs> <laughs> they don't follow the truck, but I have worked in other situations where fish releases and birds so that's a big thing oh. for herring and shad actually a lot of times as if we're going to count like alewives or blueback herring or some of those river herring species the cormorants are very uh, smart and they like to come in and wow. sit and wait for you yeah um other things as well actually like eels can be they'll they'll kind of figure out your schedule on where you're going to go and then um on coast, <laughs> coastal areas blue crabs blue crabs will actually come up into the streams and Oh try goodness. to get that fish. Yeah, so predators are definitely a big part of fisheries, oh. whether or not that predator is a fish. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. So that's our stocking truck and a little bit about what we do with uh, fish stocking. I don't know if I mentioned brook trout. Yeah, so rainbows, brook trout, and browns are the big main ones that we do. Come on, You're just telling me it's updated, that is good. <laughs> we also do a lot of uh, lakes and river surveys. So the trout stocking program is a big thing that we do to serve our anglers directly. The lake and river surveys are a little bit, are sort of half serving our, our recreational anglers and half serving conservation directly. What is and an angler? An angler is someone who fishes. Oh. 
That's your person. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. That's okay. Um, That's okay. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I try not to say Fisher because then wildlife will get confused because a Fisher is a type of is an animal. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> so yes. Yeah, so our lake, our lake and river surveys are more for for everyone. It gives us a chance to figure out what fish are where. Um, and we can tell people what fish are where. And actually, I get emails sometimes like, "Oh, I'm I've been fishing in this area. Do you know I've only caught these two species? Do you know what else is there?" And I can look up what else is there to give them a little bit of encouragement. Like, "Oh yeah, you haven't caught any of the yellow perch that are in there. You should try for those." Um, two of the big lake. Uh, reservoir surveys that we do are on Quabbin and Wachusett. We've been monitoring those lake trout population. Lake trout get really, really large, like really, really large. Um, and they come up to spawn before the winter as we're sort of making that transition into winter. Um, so you can see us here, we're in our life suits because this is on Wachusett Reservoir. Under a certain te water temperature, we have to wear them for safety. And so these will keep us warm if we were to fall in and they also float. Um, they kind of feel like the Michelin Man when you're wearing <laughs> So they're, little, they're kind of funny that way. Um, but what we do, you can actually see a lake trout right here on a measuring board. And we have someone gonna take, who's going to take weight, someone who's recording things like length and sex. Um, and we're also putting a tag in that fish. So if we catch it again this year or next year or five years in the future, we actually know what fish that is. Mm -hmm. It has a unique identifier and we can track its weight length over time. Are there morphological differences in the fins to tell the sex? Um, there are not for this species. Uh, because they're coming up for their spawning run, they're actually, we call it ripe for fish. Um, and so if you give them a little push on their belly, they'll let out a little bit of either eggs or we call it milk for fish, like oh. sperm. Uh, and we can, so that way we can directly tell oh. what sex it is based on what comes out of it. Uh, I'm sure they enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I'm not sure. They seem not to. <laughs> well, they actually, they, they usually seem pretty indifferent to it. Um, yeah. Some of the other things we do besides those large reservoir surveys is we do a lot of cold water fisheries surveys, and we also do a lot of um, shock boat and shock backpack surveys. Those actually go hand in hand together. So the cold water surveys, cold water, cold water resources are really important right now. We're basically trying to figure out which streams uh, are the coldest, and so where those where those springs that are coming up to feed them are going to be really cold. With, with climate change, it's especially important because we're losing those cold water resources. And we have fish that are dependent on them, especially our native brook trout. The brook trout is a really important native species for a whole slew of reasons. Um, and there are other ones as well that are cold water specific species like sculpin that are honestly really cute. <laughs> I think. Um, yeah, they're kind of like, like a little guppy looking thing. Uh, so identifying these cold water resources are important uh, for a whole number of reasons. We tend to do the cold water surveys with backpack shockers. Um, so you can see a backpack shocker here. And this is a picture of brook trout up here. They're also very pretty. Uh, the backpack shockers, what it does is it generates a small electrical current. And it's fine-tuned so that when it passes through the water, it stuns the fish. And so we can then scoop it up with a net, take a length, check it out, find the species, and then let it go. And return it to the water. It's a really neat system. You do that too. Um, you can see we're doing we have really small nets here. It's actually on Gates Brook, which which is a trip a, a tributary of um, Wachusett Reservoir there. So we're right near the office in this picture, and I believe we actually pulled that fish out of Gates Brook. So these pictures go together. Um, when we're doing surveys on lakes or on larger areas of water, then we'll use a boat or sometimes a barge, which is like a, almost like a sled that we tow along as we're in the water. Um, and we always have waders on, so these are plastic waders so that we don't get shocked. And so when we're on the boat, of course, we're out of the water and the boat has these sort of prongs coming off of it like this and it generates electricity out here. So you have a driver and you have two people with nets up here to connect them out and do the same thing. We usually have a, a live well on the boat, so it's a big bucket of water, big tank. Um, and so we can get fish and put them in there, make sure they recover, lengths, weights, species IDs, and then put them back into How them. many do you do? Um, or what qualifies enough for your study? So it sort of, so for the cold water, surveys, those are mostly stream, pretty much all streams. 
Um, I believe we did 40 this past year. Those have to be done within a certain time frames just for, uh, for, for uh, legal purposes mm -hmm. so that if that data is going to be used to protect an area, it's been done basically between um, in, basically in July and August, so that's in the hottest points of the summer, is it still cold? Mm -hmm. we can, so it's, that's our, the best proof we can give that it's truly a cold water resource. But lakes or non-cold water streams, we can do sort of any time we want. Um, and those are really dependent on what we want to know. So there could be a year where we don't do any. It mm -hmm. could be a year where we do 15 or more, um, depending on what questions we have, what research we have going on, and, and those types of things. Mm -hmm. So for example, the um, Quinnipoxit Dam, which is also connected to Wachusett Reservoir, is being removed in the next couple of years. That removal has been approved. And so we're planning a study to see how that removal affects the stream community in that area of fish. Does it, do we see more movement? Do we see different species than we did before? Um, and so for that, we'll do multiple surveys a year on that one body of water. Um, so it really just depends what our questions are. It's sort of like you're an investigator. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> so we also have wildlife life activities, as I mentioned. Our wildlife activities include things like helping with bear monitoring. So we do have black bear in Massachusetts. One really neat way that we can monitor them is by putting up these fur catch wires. So what these are meant to do is we find an area where we know a bear has it will pass through. We can usually identify this. We call them game trails. You can usually see, um, read the, some people can really read the woods and track animals and can identify places where animals move through a lot. So we'll put up these wires with, they sort of just have little, they're kind of like barbed wires, but mm -hmm. not quite as harsh. Um, and the bear will brush against it and it'll just grab a tuft of its fur. And then we can use that fur to do different analyses like DNA and things like that to find out what that bear was. Um, and any other information that they can pull from that hair. It's really actually pretty neat that we can get so much without even seeing the animal. Uh, we also do a lot of bird banding and monitoring. So this is actually our wildlife biologist Mike and our district manager Todd and they're there with a, a juvenile eagle. You can see here. They look kind of gnarly when they're that young. <laughs> and so we're, you know, bald eagles of course are really important. Um, to our country in general, but they've made a really great rebound recently, and, but we're still monitoring their populations and just making sure that, especially at the chick stage, that they're gonna be healthy, that we think they're gonna make it, um, and if there are any issues, the potential that we intervene and try to solve them. And for, for geese banding, that's a really big one, too. We'll go out and we'll find Canada geese. We mostly are banding Canada geese because with, with that species, we have two different sort of morphs, if you will, or two different flavors of geese. One is the migratory, that's your classic Canada geese. They come here and they migrate for winter and then they come back. We also have some resident geese that have learned, you know, I could just hang out. <laughs> there, are some, uh, there are some bodies of water that, you know, maybe a, maybe a factory dumps warm water into and they realize, you know, maybe I could just hang out here for a little while. A little while. The problem with that is it has a really big impact on water quality and a couple of other things. So yeah. <laughs> we really want those birds to fly. Do you know where they came from? Hmm? They came from the, when they used to use the geese as a decoy, live decoys. Mm. So they had the live decoys tethered out and they did that for year after year after year. So the descendants of those geese don't know how to migrate. Yeah. They're also it's really being fed very well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Feeding, is, feeding is very bad all around. Mm -hmm. The only thing that is really okay is bird feeders in the wintertime, but otherwise mm -hmm. feeding of animals is, mm -hmm. is pretty much always bad. But yeah, the Canada geese uh, uh, monitoring and banding, we actually do when they're molting, so they can't fly. Mm -hmm. So it's a bunch of us out there corralling <laughs> geese into, a, into sort of a net area. Um, and then we're able to put bands on them and, and track those animals yeah, over time as on? well. <laughs> we have boots. It gets messy. Oh, because sure. they, they, like, they, they do make a oh. They like to poop. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Video. <laughs> yeah, what? Yeah, your question. Uh, what about swans? Yeah. Swans? So the population of swans yeah. out here, no, that's wrong exponentially. Yes. Yeah. 
it, it, swans we do not um, band or track. It would be preferable if we did not have any swans, because swans are incredibly invasive and horrible for the environment. Mm. Um, and other states actually have eradication programs. We do not. So uh, we don't condone swans, um, mm. but we also we don't study them because we're not concerned about the persistence of their populations in any way. Don't they try to substitute the eggs for ones that won't hatch? Um, Sometimes, so, so there are there are a couple of birds that will do that. That um, or a couple of programs. Sometimes they'll 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 swap eggs. Sometimes they'll just other states will just eradicate directly. Um, but Mass Wildlife doesn't have any any programs currently for for swans. We just try to encourage people not to feed them, um, and certainly not to import them. <laughs> yeah. Another wildlife um, activity that we have is the LART team, the Large Animal Response Team. And so this tends to, uh, we tend to be called out for this if there's a moose that's somewhere it's not supposed to be, um, <laughs> or if there's a bear that is somewhere it's not supposed to be. So for moose, sometimes, uh, so moose do occur in Massachusetts, and when the young are weaned off of their mothers, sometimes they get a little bit lonely because they're alone for the first time. And sometimes they want to make a friend with a horse mm -hmm. or something else that doesn't necessarily want to be its friend back. <laughs> so uh, we sometimes get moose that are hanging around places that, you know, in residential areas that they don't want them and they can actually cause damage to fences and things like that. Um, and they can also be quite aggressive animals. Uh, they, they're a little bit uh, stubborn in that way, mm -hmm. moose, so they're not, this, they're not uh, really a safe animal to be around at all. They're, again, a wild animal. The other time we'll get moose calls is when they're near roads. So highways in particular have a boundary area where if a moose comes within a, that boundary area, it needs to be darted, youth, uh, not euthanized, but um, sedated mm -hmm. and moved mm -hmm. to a different area. Mm -hmm. And if a moose continues to seek out highway areas, then we have to deal with it another way. But this large animal response team is a way for us to ensure the safety of people around these large animals. So again, for bears as well, if we have a new, we call them nuisance bears, bears that if a, a certain individual, just that one specific bear is continually getting into trash or it's, you know, continually entering someone's yard and is a threat, a direct threat, then we'll move that bear or otherwise deal with it. Um, but a lot of times these can just be dealt with by relocating an animal because it's just confused, like the moose. And sometimes they figure it out on their own, and all we have to do is go down and monitor the situation, tell people, we know there's a moose here or a bear here, please don't go near it or park your car and look at it because they'll actually get more accustomed to people that way. So whenever we have a, um, a large animal issue, we encourage people not to go and look at it or take pictures, even though it's really tempting, you know, uh, because the more it sees people and the more it feels like, oh, there's just people there and they're not a threat to me, then the more comfortable it, you know, the more comfortable it feels around people and the more brazen that it'll get. So that's one thing, that's another thing we do. Um, there is some wildlife stalking, it's not fish, even though fish are technically wildlife. That's my bone that I, I like to pick. <laughs> um, but we do stuff pheasants for hunting. So pheasants, you can see a pheasant here, it's just this medium-sized bird. Um, it's a really large hunting program. A lot of people love hunting pheasants, and so we'll release those, especially in our wildlife management areas um, during pheasant season, so people can go out and hunt those birds, just like we release fish, so people can go out and catch those fish. Um, a lot of people hunt these birds, just like a lot of people catch our fish, and they'll take them home and actually, you know, um, they'll, they'll prep them and put them in their freezers and cook them for dinner. And so they're, the animals are to good use, which is what we like to hear. And they, they do stock about 13,000 birds per year, so it's, it's a decently large uh, program that we have. And finally, for one week a year, we do biological game check. So I mentioned before, game check occurs when someone uh, harvests a deer and they need to check it in. So anytime someone is hunting and they harvest an animal, they have to check it in and report it to us because we have issued that license for taking the animal. We want to know if they actually took an animal. It helps us track populations over time. And for one week in the beginning of shotgun season, 
Um, we'll also do biological check, which means they have to bring it in person, even though even if there's an online option for other times of the year, that one week has to be in person. And we get to take biological samples, so we can actually age deer based on how their teeth look. So we get age, um, we get sex on the deer, because we can tell based on the antlers, uh, for the most part. And we, can, we also take some swabs. Um, recently, we've been tracking COVID in deer, which has been really interesting. Co a deer actually do get COVID. Uh, and it's, it seems like it's not really transmitted to people. Um, I think they've only had, like, I think in the whole U.S., there's only been two cases or so, and they were out in the Midwest where mm -hmm. they deer farm a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that, but nothing has ever happened with wild deer and, and mm -hmm. people. But we, it's useful to track COVID in the deer because it teaches us a lot about how the virus mutates. And so we can use the mutation information that's occurring in the deer to help inform and predict how COVID will mutate in people and help develop vaccines in the future. So that's pretty neat. Mm -hmm. um, you can see here, some of the check stations look different. So our office is a biological check station. Some of these occur at other businesses. They'll host us. Um, but this is one of our field ones. So we're hanging out inside this trailer. And this is our way station here, where we'll put the deer on and get a weight. Um, and again, check its, its teeth for age and take whatever swabs that we need. We also get location data off of uh, those deer because they'll report to us where they got the deer. Uh, if we shift to our habitat work now, we have 51 WMA's wildlife management areas in our district. You can see this is a, just the big map of all of the wildlife management areas uh, in or otherwise conservation areas in Massachusetts. And so just within Worcester County, there's 51 of them. We do a lot of habitat management in these areas. The point of the wildlife management areas is to provide good habitat for animals and allow the public to recreate however they want to in an area that is meant to have animals in it. So especially for hunting, um, but also for other purposes as well. And so we'll manage that habitat by mowing. Sometimes we'll do, um, we'll just mow areas. A lot of these habitat management efforts are to make open spaces because as if you think about you know when we typically see like we, ju we just say the woods we don't even say wild areas right it's all woods yeah. <laughs> and um, over time because we've lost a lot of our um, ecosystem dynamics because because you know as humans we have residential areas we have commercial areas we have roads everywhere a lot of the environment has lost that dynamic change that it would normally have. And so historically, there would have been these open areas that just occur naturally. So for example, if a beaver built a dam and that dammed up water got really, really large, and then over time that beaver died or was eaten and that dam blew out, and then all of that open water would turn back into a river, that would all then be open grassland. Right, and so these dynamic processes would occur. So we have to sort of replicate them as best we can. So again, the mowing is one way that we we manage for open areas. We do a lot of forestry practices as well. So we'll we'll cut in different ways depending on how we want to manage that area. So while clear cutting sometimes has negative connotations, it can actually be a really useful wildlife management tool if we want to create an open space. We can also selectively harvest trees to leave just a couple standing or to leave just small ones standing, again, depending on what kind of habitat we want to create. We'll also do prescribed fires. Prescribed fires mean that we burn really large swaths of land very carefully. <laughs> um, and it's a really good way to manage for native uh, vegetation, native plants. Because even when we're cutting things or mowing things, a lot of times those non-native or invasive plants are the first ones to come back. Um, and so the best we can do in those situations is just keep mowing every year <laughs> as best as possible. But the way to bring back the native plants is really to burn, because they're the ones that are going to do the best after the burn. Hmm. And you can actually see some of these uh, management actions have a lot of impact. So this is our Muddy Brook WMA, and it's the difference between 
2010 and 2019, so almost 10 years apart. You can see how this is all this green all around the river here, and this has a lot more open space, hmm. much more open space. And there, there are some places that are purely open space, some that have some trees scattered about, but it's not a, a tight canopy. Um, and so again, that's sort of, that's the output of all of these management practices. Where is Muddy Brook? That is a great question, and I'm blanking. <laughs> You're not old enough to blank. <laughs> I'm using my newbie card. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Lesser. Yeah. <laughs> I just got past my, my six month job <laughs> anniversary. Um, you know, I don't know, but I could. it's easy to look up. I can look that up later for sure. So I've been talking about a lot of our programs. So the trout stocking, pheasant stocking, and our WMAs. I, I'll pause to mention that if ever you want to look these up online, it's actually really easy to get to them. It's just mass.gov, M-A-S-S dot G-O-V, slash whatever it is you're interested in. <laughs> so slash trout takes you right to the trout stocking page. Mass.gov slash pheasant takes you right to the pheasant page. Mass.gov slash WMA takes you right to the WMA page, mm -hmm. right to our, all of our wildlife management areas. It's, it's, they've made it very easy to find those couple of things. Oh, Harwick. It's in Harwick. Yes, it is in Harwick, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's all part of the watershed for the watershed. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yep. Exactly. Hardwick is Wachusett watershed? Yeah, it comes out of... I think it would be more kind of Guavin. Well, it comes out of the Guavin and it goes down to Wachusett. Right, so they're connected, okay. actually. Yeah, and, and we actually have some underwater um, aquifers that go directly over. So the Quinnipoxa Dam I mentioned before, there's a pump house next to it that actually brings water from the Quavin to Wachusett. Is that right by the Springdale Mill site? Yes. Yep. I'm with Wachusett Greenway. Oh, yeah? Okay. So I, I'm a real trail maintainer. Cool. Nice. Okay, yeah, I know where the real trail is right there. Yeah. Our real trail starts in Sterling and ends in Barry, 32 miles. Wow. That's pretty long. I take care of the 10, mi 10 <laughs> miles from Ruffin Mass off Glenwood Road to Barry, which is 10 miles continuous. Wow. I'm allowed to drive That's on it. Long. Yeah, you're the only one? <laughs> yeah, you're the only one. <laughs> and it comes out of the Quabbin district. Oh, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, it's it's um, sort of a gray zone where they, they converge there. Yeah. Um, so the, the last big umbrella of our programming is in outreach and education. We do a number of different outreach and education um, programs and, and a lot of our work is always has a touch of outreach and education um, partially because everything that we do is is public knowledge of course um, but we also you know make an effort that when we're trout stocking to incorporate components of outreach and education either we're in court we're bringing out schools and letting the kids release fish or um, otherwise doing some amount of outreach and education but these are three of our big programs that we have going on right now um, we have a lot of learn to fish events so we each district hosts multiple every summer uh, and we bring out people who either have never fished before or feel very novice at fishing and we actually bring all the equipment ourselves and we, ju we just take them fishing for an afternoon it's really lovely and a lot of people who would never attempt fishing come out and do it it's really really fun you could be we also do similarly hunter education so to get your hunting license you have to have passed a hunter education course mm -hmm. uh, and so hunting education is part outreach and part required education for people who want to hunt um, but it's a really fun program as well and it, it's very inclusive of people who want to hunt and have different hunting styles so we'll have archery shotgun um, and we also have primitive firearms like like black powder and finally, one thing we've been working on a lot recently is access improvement. So on our WMAs, as well as in the areas that we stock trout, um, making sure that access for people to get in is, is good um, and is acceptable to us. And if there are places that we can improve that, we're trying to improve it. And so that could mean um, one thing we've been doing lately is putting in gates to places. So we'll, we'll gate a road into the WMA 
but if someone someone can approach our office or apply in other ways for like a handicap permit and we can issue a key to the gate so that they can actually drive in and not so for example if you're hunting that way you don't have to drag your deer all the way out because <laughs> mm. um, that's something that I don't I actually don't hunt uh, and it's something I never considered until you know I talked to a lot of hunters that where you get your deer you have to drag it out from them. <laughs> and it can be really long uh, and definitely is very heavy mm. so um, that's one thing that we've been doing for for access improvement and I always welcome suggestions for that I've gotten a number of calls recently about fishing access improvement in places or places that could be emphasized more like Bell Pond in Worcester for example is, is really handicap accessible uh, and, and is a great a great spot for people who want to fish and be able to just drive up and fish. Um, there, there's a couple other places as well. So that is all I have to share for my presentation. I'm more than happy to, to chat about any questions that you might have. I've kind of put up a couple of reminders about some of the topics I covered. Um, again, that we have fisheries work, we have wildlife work, we do habitat management, and we also do a lot of outreach and education from our office. Um, and once again, I'll just say there are materials up here that you can help yourself to, and my card is here as well. If after today you think you have questions or just want to chat about fish or wildlife, I guess, um, <laughs> <laughs> you can give me or the office a call. But yeah, thanks everyone. Great. 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 Yeah. Good question. So, uh, how long have we been doing this, Massachusetts, stocking mm -hmm. fish and pheasants? Has it always been? For a long time. It has been. Okay. You yeah. guys that did the turkey school? Yeah. That's yeah. I was going to say, the I turkey. think back in the day that you yeah. used to do turkey. Really? They yeah. released huh. some up at Whittier's around here. Right. Yeah. 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 And I thought yeah. I'd never yeah. seen one, but now. Oh, now <laughs> they're all of them. Is a fishing license required to fish in salt water? Yes. Same fishing license for fresh water? No. Two different, different two different licenses. licenses. Although I, I I can't remember what the age thresholds are, but they become free at certain ages. So so it, you probably just have to log on and look and uh, yeah, that's true. The information's in here. So if you came into one of the offices, or if you have access to a computer, or you have someone who ha could access a computer for you. So we do that um, quite often here. Oh yeah, you do. People up for their fishing license. Oh great, so. that's awesome. Yeah, so it's 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 a formality at a certain age, but when we have um, members of the public who still have to pay for their licenses, that money goes into funding the programs, and so it helps us. Even even when the licenses become free, we still require that you buy it because it tells us how many people 70. are out there fishing. Seventy for for freshwater for, for a free license. For freshwater, I think that they're two different. It says ages. resident fishing, citizen age seventy or over, or paraplegic, mm -hmm. blind, intellectual disability. It's free. Yeah, I think for freshwater, I think saltwater might be sixty-five. They still have free license for Native Americans. I believe so. Um, our district actually doesn't. Uh, I've ne I've never had a case of. Um, dealing with someone who's Native American because most of the tribal lands are actually in the eastern either in northeast or southeast districts um, but I believe they do and I, I know that they they do still have uh, you know partnerships and, and they try to be cooperative. My father qualified but I don't. Oh really? Because I'm only 12 and a half percent Native American my father was 25. Oh. You didn't make that. You have to be 25% Native American. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then there's a trick to show you the prejudice against the Native American. <laughs> My father was allowed to go clamming in any community in the state. But if you have a community in the state that has salt water, you're allowed to pick a bushel of clams. Whereas my father could only pick a peck. They're, the regulations yeah, definitely they, vary. They cut them down a little bit. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, for the uh, goose tagging, do you share information with Canada for the migratory goose? Or do they you know, share with you? Um, I think if so. Again, I'm not on the wildlife side, but <laughs> I don't know if we directly do unless there's need, it's like need for the data in some way. You know, like if we so the way that sort of the progression of studies is that we 
come up with an idea, a question that we want to know about, we collect data, and then we analyze that data. And I, I think the only time that we would do that is in that analysis phase to ask them. But uh, honestly, for a lot of the questions that we have, we don't need data on the other side. We're, we're mostly curious as to what those birds are doing here, how many we have, um, how many returners we have, or not returners we have. Um, and so we don't necessarily need to know what they're what's going on up in Canada, and, and I'm not actually not sure what programs they have up there for those birds, but it, that's a good question. Yeah. And why? It certainly depends on the question, yeah. And the other questions. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having me. Yeah, if there are things that you're curious about in the future, I'm happy to come back and like focus on one thing or talk about something or teach something. Do an activity, just let me know. Yeah. Thanks all for